Well, in the second video, let's start to explore those crystal orbitals in a little bit more detail. We need a good method for quantifying how bonding or anti-bonding they are. And therefore, we'll introduce the so-called k-vector, which provides a really excellent method for quantifying the wave functions of each crystal orbital and saying how many nodes, be it bonding or anti-bonding, there are in that wave function. I hope you enjoy this one. So we're going to look at how we quantify the atomic overlaps and their energies. And we're going to use the LCAO method, the method of linearly combining atomic orbitals, to form not just molecular orbitals, they're much bigger than a molecule, but crystal orbitals. So here I'm combining the atomic orbitals, summing them to obtain the crystal orbital wave function psi. And I'm summing the product of some coefficient multiplied by the constituent basis function, as it's called, i.e. the atomic orbital, 3s for sodium, and summing those over all possible atoms. The key here is not just the magnitude of this coefficient, but its sign, as we alluded to earlier in our description of the polyenes. If that sign is positive, then the phase of the atomic orbital is unchanged. If the sign of C is negative, then the phase is reversed, and a change in sign then in turn leads to a node in the wave function of the crystal orbital. For example, let's look at an infinite 1D chain of atoms. We'll define the atomic separation between two atoms as A, and we'll begin by again looking at S orbital overlaps, which in turn will form a sigma type crystal orbitals. Given I have an infinite number of atoms, then I'm going to have an infinite number of crystal orbitals, and the number of nodes can range from zero in the most stable crystal orbital where everything is interfering in phase, to an orbital where essentially there's an infinite number of nodes. So the number of nodes will range from zero to infinity. So again, let's make all of the coefficients positive. So now my crystal orbital wave function I'm adding this overlap coefficient, or the coefficient c, multiplied by the uh, atomic orbital for number 1, for number 2, number 3, etc. But in every single case, the important thing here is the signs. I'm adding them all. All coefficients are positive, there's no nodes, and for s orbitals, all of the overlaps are bonding. And there they are. We're constructively interfering between every single atom. The other extreme is to alternate the signs. And so now the crystal orbital wave function for atom number 1, it's plus, atom number 2, minus, 3, plus, 4, minus, etc., all the way up to infinity. And so because I'm changing sign every single time, I'm going to have an infinite number of nodes in that wave function. And for these s orbitals, as soon as I switch the sign of the orbital, I've switched the phase, I know that they overlap destructively, and these nodes are actually anti-bonding. The nodes, the sign changes in the crystal orbital wave functions then, form a repeating pattern. And it's possible to identify a wavelength for that pattern, a wavelength for the sign changes. Let's start with the simplest, where the signs are alternating, where I'm all anti-bonding. So again, this plus and minus is not charged. It's whether I'm adding or subtracting, if you like, the wave function of the atomic orbital. It's the sign of that coefficient. And so now I can take that pattern and I identify a wavelength that represents both the repeat separation of the nodes and actually the signs of the phases. So in this case, my green curve identifies that the wavelength of this nodal arrangement is 2a. So I have to go a distance of not 1a, but 2a to get the pattern to repeat. Instead of using the wavelength, we actually use a wave number, or what we're going to call it a wave vector, k. And this also counts the number of nodes within the, the wave function of the crystal orbital. k is the number of full cycle and for a wave, a full cycle is 2 pi. It's the number of full cycle wavelengths that lie within the atom repeat distance A. So K is equal to 2 pi over lambda 
In this case, we know the repeat wavelength is 2a, so that leaves us with k is equal to pi over a. I just said that effectively it's the number of full cycle wavelengths in the atom repeat distance, and let's shade one in. There it is. Here's my repeat distance a. Just half of the full cycle lies within that repeat distance. So rather than calling this the all antibonding crystal orbital, we're now going to define it by using this k symbolism, where pi over a is the most anti-bonding wavelength repeat of nodes that I can possibly have. Let's look at another extreme, where there are no sign changes. And for s orbitals, we know that means that all of the overlaps are in phase, and it's an all-bonding repeat. So if there are no sign changes, there are no nodes. And so the wavelength is effectively infinity. But rather than using infinity in a wavelength, in terms of k, we'll see that there are no wavelengths within the atom repeat, because it has an infinite wavelength. And so this arrangement, where I'm just adding every single atomic wave function to get the wave function of the crystal orbital, plus, 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 k is equal to zero. And so my values of k can range from zero, or bonding, in this case, decays pi over a, where I have alternating signs. As I mentioned, between these extremes of all bonding, which we'll now start to call k equals zero, and all anti-bonding, pi over a, there's an infinite number of other crystal orbitals, and their wavelengths will lie somewhere between 2a and infinity, and therefore their k values will lie between zero and pi over a. Let's look at a couple of other examples. So here's a crystal orbital where the wave function is derived from the atomic orbitals with the following signs. I have the first five atomic orbitals plus plus plus, and then I change the sign, and then the next five are minus 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 minus, and then I change the sign again, and then I go plus plus plus, and it just repeats. So that's the periodicity of the sign changes of the atomic orbitals that constitute the crystal orbital wave function. And you can see here then the periodicity, the separation of these nodes is 5a. Now let's add on the wave that describes that repeat in green. Here it is. The full cycle wavelength is 10a, twice the node separation. Now we've defined k as being 2 pi over lambda, and so in this case, lambda is 10a, so this is 2 pi over 10a. In other words, it's 1 fifth pi over a. Here's another one. In this case, I've chosen a repeat for the nodes such that they change signs every 2a. My crystal orbital wave function is comprised of a sum of atomic orbitals where the signs of the first two atomic orbitals are plus plus, the next two minus minus, then it's plus plus, minus minus, ad infinitum. So the periodicity of the sign changes is 2a, and so my wavelength for this crystal orbital is twice that repeating node separation, it's 4a. So k, 2 pi over lambda, it's pi over 2a, or a half pi over a. And so actually, there's only now one quarter of the wave cycle that lies within the repeat distance a. And you can take a look at this to prove that to yourself. Now, if we look at this crystal orbital, we'll see, in fact, that it's non-bonding. So at k is pi over 2a, there's an equal number of in-phase and out-of-phase interactions. It's out of phase at every node, where I switch sign. Here's one phase for this s orbital to the left of it. The other one is the opposite phase, so that's destructive anti-bonding. But between these first two, where the sign is not changing, they are constructively interfering. There's a bonding overlap. So it's bonding, anti-bonding, bonding, anti-bonding, etc. So because there are an equal number of in- and out-of-phase interactions, the net result is a non-bonding crystal orbital that's no more stable or no less stable than the constituent atomic orbitals. 
are thinking in terms of k, that is pi over 2a, halfway between 0, which is all bonding, and k equals pi over a, which is all anti-bonding, pi over 2a, non-bonding. But of course we have an infinite number of other crystal orbitals that we could start to quantify, one of which we did here at one-fifth pi over a. Now the approach that we're using, the one that we've built upon from molecular orbital theory, is the linear combination of atomic orbital approach, the LCAO approach. In physics language, which is sometimes hard to translate, this is called the tight binding model. And for this approach, the wave function of the crystal orbital is just the sum over all atoms of the product of these coefficients and the atomic orbitals that we're using as our basis set. And the key is figuring out the sine of C, but also the magnitude of C. For a periodic solid, we've shown a couple of examples, pictures, of the possible crystal orbitals that result from a given sequence of signs, we can actually represent the whole wave function using a mathematical formulation that's called a block function. And this block function is, as shown here, where the wave function of a crystal orbital for a certain k value is equal to the sum over all atoms of e to the i k n a where n is the atom number, 0 through infinity, k is our wave vector that we've already introduced, i of course is the complex number, and a is the atom-atom separation. It's that function multiplied by the basis function that we're using to construct the crystal orbitals, in other words the atomic orbitals. It's that product. It's really the sum then of all of these coefficients. And it's a plane wave function that modulates the signs, i.e. the phase, of the constituent atomic orbitals, and also the magnitude of the contribution on every single atom. Let's just check what is generated by this function for a couple of simple examples. Let's take our k equals zero case, where now we know I'm adding all of the atomic orbitals in phase, and so there are no sign changes in the wave function of the crystal orbital. So e to the chi n a, that's actually equal to cos k n a plus i sine k n a. Let's not worry too much about that here. It actually turns out it's equal to, for a value of k equal to zero, is equal to one raised to the power n, where n is the identifier for each atom. Where the first atom in my chain is atom number zero, the second one atom number one, third one atom number two, etc., etc. 1 raised to any value of n, of course, is 1. And so there are no sign changes from one atomic orbital to the next. And so the wavelength is infinity. There are no nodes. Everybody is bonding. Now let's insert a value of k into this function that's pi over a. When I do, I find that the solution now is minus 1 to the power n. So when n is 0, positive. When n is 1, it's negative. When it's 2, it's positive. The signs alternate. And so this function is giving back what we know is the case, because at k is equal to pi over a, the wavelength is 2 over a, everybody is out of phase, and I have the sequence of atomic orbitals that we've shown previously, with alternating signs. And so that's what this function is doing. It's modulating these signs apparently correctly, but of course there's an infinite number of k values, and so we could sit here for a long time putting other values of k in there to get out all of the sequences. So while the key point is that this block function, the function that represents our crystal orbital wave function, often called block waves, is changing the signs of the atomic orbitals, and it's introducing the nodes into the wave function. But I also want to make you aware that it modulates the magnitude of those atomic orbital contributions, the Cs. So let's just go to the example I'd shown on the last slide, where k is equal to one-fifth pi over a. And this is my repeat of atomic s orbitals, five pluses, five minuses, etc., with then the nodal planes separated by 5a, establishing this wave with a periodicity of 10a that describes the crystal orbital function that results.
The equation of this wave is this e to the i k n a function. And so it's successfully modulating the signs, but it also modulates the magnitude of the atomic orbital contributions. Now we're going to modulate the amplitude of the atomic wave functions. So first let's add s orbital type wave functions on each atom. So here's an s function, s, s, s. Here I've changed the phase because now they're negative, so they're subtracted, pointing down. Then it repeats such that they're all positive. Then I have the nodal plane, they become negative again. So our block function is successfully changing those signs in the correct sequence. But now, at the nodal plane, rather than going from this strong positive function immediately to this strong negative function, there's a gradual change in the magnitudes. And so I can damp these S functions through the wave. Rather than talking, let me just show it. So now what I've done is modulate the amplitude and fit it to this wave. Let's take away the original S functions that weren't modulated. And there we are. And so in yellow and green, now we have a block type wave that is modulating the sign. Yellow is positive, green is negative, and therefore successfully modulating the phase of the atomic orbitals. But it's also successfully modulating the amplitude of each atomic orbital, such that it peaks in the middle, switches, goes to the opposite phase, gradual decay, etc. You'll see a lot more about this in solid-state physics.